Fiji, an archipelago located in the Pacific Ocean. Of its more than 300 islands, only about 100 are inhabited. In these parts, life rolls along to the lazy rhythm of the long ocean swell. There are three colors to the Fijis, the white of the long beaches, the turquoise blue of the lagoons, and the green of the jungle. And rugby is a religion here. Frank, a rugby coach, chose to combine the easy life of the islands with his passion for the oval ball. He combs the villages of the outlying islands, hoping to discover the rare gem of Fijian rugby. Hannah is a surfing champion. She and her friend Issei are in search of the perfect wave. Their quest will take them all the way to Cloudbreak, one of the most beautiful waves in the world. For Hannah, the ocean is her lifeblood. Manasa lives in Benga, an unspoiled atoll where the traditional rituals form the bedrock of the community. In the shelter of the barrier reef, just a stone's throw from the village, Manasa goes diving with his son Tumbi to feed their guardian angels, the shark gods. I live in a very little paradise, you know. I, I don't want to stay in uh, overseas, Australia, America, uh, maybe France or Europe. I like my little world. It looks like this. Uh, no big, no small. Uh, I leave this in my heart. The Fiji Islands, located in the heart of the Pacific Ocean, are isolated from the rest of the world. Situated 2,000 kilometers north of New Zealand and about 3,000 kilometers east of Australia, these volcanic islands are made up of mountains covered with tropical forest. It's a corner of the world where time has never mattered, perhaps because the weather is so clement all year round. Before Christianity, many people in Fiji believe that uh, they need a guardian. We're supposed to have a guardian. That is before Christianity. So uh, many people in Fiji, they choose different types of uh, uh, nature. Uh, they choose nature, like uh, a little mountain, uh, ocean, moon, sun. But the people from my village, they choose uh, sharks to be their sea god. So the story goes like that. Uh, we believe that that uh, the sharks in the oceans, uh, those are our guardian. As soon as we jump in the water, we don't have any fear because the same guardian is looking after us. Uh, you know, ocean, they rule the ocean, right? Sharks rule the ocean. They, they balance the ocean, okay? When we jump in the water to meet them, we respect them. Manasa Bulivu has been diving under the protection of his shark gods every day for the last 15 years. These turquoise waters were part of his childhood, and his first dive was a revelation. Ever since, he has been doing his best to preserve this underwater realm and protect the coral barrier reef.
Every weekend, Manasa takes his family to the island of Benga, where he was born, across from the main island. <laughs> the ferry does a daily run and takes two hours to make the crossing. Everyone on the boat knows Manasa. They even call him Papa. He holds a very important position in his community. He is the village spokesman. Rukua is a little village like so many others in the Fijis. A few houses by the lagoon, coconut trees, no roads, no stores, and villagers enjoying the good life. That is my village. This is where I uh, was raised. This is uh, from my ancestor, my great-grandfather. And until today, I have a family, and this is my home. My son, my daughter, they all born in this village. I found my beautiful wife in this village, so uh, I don't have to go away. Everything is right there, and the ocean behind me, that is our resources, and uh, we respect the animal in the ocean because we believe that uh, we are one. So it is like a, a freedom paradise. This is nobody want to live. We want to stay here forever. <laughs> yes. I have a little bit of a heart problem. In 2007, I was in hospital, and uh, since then, my whole life changed. Um, it's changed completely. Yeah. I choose uh, the way to be a very honest Christian, uh, you know, to worship uh, the mighty God. And uh, I'm very proud to be a, a preacher and look after a church. The everlasting life is only given by the master himself. Hallelujah. By God himself. By the Lord Jesus himself. No one can give this life. It's only him himself. In the Fiji Islands, Sunday is a day devoted to prayer. Several families have come by boat from the island's other villages to attend Manasa's services. Afterwards, the parishioners stay to share a meal together. It's a traditional ways, like to share. Like Fiji, uh, the standard of living is low, so most of the thing, so most of the family that doesn't have like a source of income, so that's why we share. The more we give, the more we get. This morning they're preparing for a traditional ceremony in the forest. The young men of this island have a special gift, walking barefoot over burning stones, the firewalk. Tunbi, Manasa's son, is going to participate for the first time. Long time waiting. I've been waiting for a long time. 26 years now. I moved to the mainland when I was small, just a small boy. And now today I'm here to do the firewalk. It's good. I'm very excited about this.
Tunbi must present himself before the sacred fire with a pure heart, and for that there are a few rules to respect. He's been uh, very honest with a promise. No coconut for four night, and no woman for four night. It's really tough for the young people, no? No woman for four nights is, yeah? I, I told the priest, I think two nights is okay. <laughs> but the priest said, oh, oh, four nights. The stones have been heating in the fire pit for five hours. The ceremony can begin. The men are totally concentrated. They're invoking the spirits and asking them for the ancestral power that only the village inhabitants possess. We walked on fire. Yeah, no pain. The stones felt cold. It's okay. <laughs> it's the power of the fire walk. We gather it here, and we use it to walk over the stones. On the island of Benga, legends and the supernatural encroach on reality. Manasa is proud of his son who has braved the sacred fire and stones for the first time. Tunbi loves diving just as much as his father. Today, like every day, they're going to see their second family, the sharks. just about to get ready to introduce myself to the underwater world. Uh, most of the animals, they, they know me very well the last 15 years. So uh, still I have to use this. Uh, they know Papa very well.
I feel great because uh, when I put my wetsuit on, my fins, my mask, with a tank behind me to enter that world down there, it's something that's in my heart. I know because in the, in the underwater world, there is my guardian there. Uh, he looks after myself, my son. The life is very different down there because you see the fish, they don't know anything about you know, the war, about what is going on up here. Uh, they're very friendly, so I want to put myself just like them. Since he had his heart attack, Manasad doesn't dive more than a few meters down. Tunbi has taken over from his father. He has a rendezvous in the depths with other sharks, the bulldogs. Manasa shares his life between these two worlds. On land, he's actively involved in the community of Rukua. He's one of the pillars of the village. In the depths, he's the privileged witness and guardian of an underwater realm. Manasa knows that these two worlds are inextricably linked and complementary. We want to keep this uh, bay and this uh, place as it is. As you can see, there is no building, no cars, no boat, <laughs> just us. And we want to keep the population of my village uh, as low as we are. Yeah? In another 10, 15 years time, I believe in my heart, this place will be still the same. And then we will pass it over to our generation to come. When I will be old, my grandchildren, you go there and use the land. Hannah Bennett and Issei Tukovu are two of the best surfers in the Fijis. They spend days on end in search of the best waves. It's good to, you know, envision yourself before you're out surfing and um, hopefully it'll be some fun waves. So, yeah, concentrate, but surfing is fun. You know, not too serious. It's for fun. Yep. So there's my wax. 
check my fins, make sure they're on tight. Hannah, who's 22 years old, is a surfing champion. She competes under the Fijian flag in international meets, and she recently won the Melanesian Cup, a meet open to the best surfers of this part of the Pacific Ocean. It takes one wave to fall in love with surfing, but it also takes one wave to just completely not want to do it again. But when you fall in love with it, it's so worth it. It's, you know, words can't really describe it. You forget about the paddling, how hard it is. You forget about, you know, almost drowning sometimes just for that feeling because it's very in the moment and um, it's very intimate with, with the ocean, with nature. Anna grew up in Rotuma, a remote group of islands in the northern Fijis. Her life goes from one side of the Pacific to the other, from California, where she's finishing up a degree in international trade, to Fiji, where she has her roots and comes to recharge her batteries. Earth is the water planet. It's everything, you know, it's all around us, it's in us. Physically, you can't live without water, but also mentally, I don't think I could live without being surrounded by the ocean. As a person, I need water. <laughs> I need the ocean to mentally be healthy and stay sane in a way. I could never live in the desert or inland or in cities for years at a time. Wherever I go, you know, I'm it's always based off of where the ocean is going to be. To set sail on the high seas, an adventure that has always inspired humanity. Ever since the dawn of time, the most daring souls have challenged the horizon in search of new lands. Select, right, go. Oh. Oh. Yes. Too much fuel. Olé. Olé. It's generally thought that migration to the islands of the Pacific proceeded gradually starting in southern China. The men and women who would discover the largest ocean on Earth first made a sojourn for several generations in Taiwan. Their most intrepid descendants pressed onward to what is now the Philippines and Indonesia. Sailing from island to island, those adventurers explored the Pacific in the hope of conquering unknown lands. Those mariners opened new routes towards virgin territory. Once they had settled Vanuatu, they were within 800 kilometers of the Fiji Islands. The Fijian people have their distant roots in a group of exceptional seafarers. In 2011, a German philanthropist decided to revive that epic journey in his own way. He built several traditional sailing canoes to undertake a sea odyssey across the Pacific to California. Hannah followed the expedition very closely. She was even a crew member when this boat first took to sea off the coast of Fiji. Angelo, a skilled sailor, quite naturally became skipper of this mythical craft, the Uto Niyalo, 
heart of the spirit. Leon, select this one. Faster, faster, faster. Fast. There were seven canoes like this, all the same, different islands, like Samoa, Tahiti had one, New Zealand had two. So we sailed as a fleet, just raising awareness and trying to prove that what our ancestors did, we can still do it. You know, we prove that we don't need fuel to travel so far, and we, and we did it, you know. The voyage was 20 months in total. Days in sea, the longest we were out there was 31. No land, no TV, <laughs> nothing, yeah. Just looking at a lot of flying fish, and that's pretty much it. These latter-day seafarers accomplished the entire crossing without the help of any navigational instruments, just like their ancestors. No charts, no GPS, no sextant. The sailors on board were armed with no more than their daring, their keen intuition, and the stars to guide them across these vast expanses. That knowledge is being lost now. Only a handful of people, they know it. So one guy in Satawal, in Micronesia, he taught five people. His wish was for that five to teach more. So we were lucky we had three of the five on the voyage. Yeah, that was a big part of people's lives back then, you know, our ancestors, this is what they did. And to see it, you know, unfold and people try to practice it the same way is, is a beautiful thing. It's reviving our culture again and it's reminding the next generations of who we are. Every time Hana comes back to the Fijis to train, she connects with Ize. He's like a big brother, but he's also an exceptional surfer who knows these islands better than anyone else. To get out to the open sea and the rollers, Hana and Ize have to cross a vast mangrove swamp, a sort of natural passage from the world of land dwellers to the realm of the surfers. Cloud break is one of the most beautiful waves in the world. It's like an El Dorado for surfers. Every year, the world's surfing elite comes here for a prestigious international meet. The jury officiates from a stand built right in the sea facing the legendary wave. For me, the perfect wave is a feeling. That's very hard, I think, when you're surfing. It's very in the moment, and it goes by so fast. Sometimes you don't appreciate, or you, you can only reflect on it after you've surfed the wave. But for me, the perfect wave is being able to actually recognize that feeling as you're surfing the wave. So a nice, long, you know, good-sized wave that as you're surfing it, you just, you're aware of oh, how good the feeling is, you know? Yeah. Nice, Dave. Woo! It's very easy to shoot waves in Fiji. The waves are so nice here. The light is perfect. Water is blue. You don't have to be a very good photographer to take great photos here. It's really easy. Look at this place. It's beautiful all by itself. Surfers form their own oh. tight-knit community, and Stuart is a well-known figure at Cloud Break. Beautiful. Come have a look at your shots. So many sick ones. Look at this shot. You're going to freak out. This is like a magazine cover. Check this out.
these waves have traveled for thousands of miles from, from a storm here in, off Antarctica, all across the ocean, and you wait for them. And then you ride their energy, and you can feel the, the whole energy of the ocean go through your body, and it's, you forget every worry of the world. You can't pay for that. There's no drug, there's no therapy you can do that is, that is better than surfing. It's like being hugged by the entire ocean. It's a really great feeling. Surfers don't pit themselves against the ocean and the waves. They strive to become their accomplices and play with the elements in order to reach a state of pure pleasure. become one with the forces of nature, a challenge that one throws down only to oneself. You feel very vulnerable, but very powerful at the same time. Um, you know, I. Sometimes I'm the biggest scaredy cat out there. I'm terrified, but that's when I feel most alive. The ocean is, is like my second home. You know, we're brought up around the ocean and nature and you just you learn to adapt a lot to your surroundings, and that's, that's a great skill to have. This is where I was born and raised, and I wouldn't have it any other way. This is my home base. I mean, everywhere I go, um, it's almost as if it makes me appreciate Fiji even more, and it makes it just as special. There were a lot of sailors in my family. My great uncles, my uncles. They sailed the South Pacific a lot, and they brought back a lot of souvenirs that would just stir our imagination. And in particular, when we were little, my brother and I had a book on Tahiti in Polynesia with a picture of an island girl on the beach, and she was bare-breasted. It was really quite alluring. <laughs> That's what set me to dreaming about the South Pacific ever since. It's a bit of a cliché, but it's the honest truth. Frank Boisvert is heading for Bukama, a village in the Yasawa Islands, isolated in the northwest of the Fijis. Frank has been an international rugby trainer for more than 40 years. Whenever he can, he goes from island to island, meeting the village rugby clubs. He's also out to spot the young talents that may someday play in the world's leading clubs. Fiji is a major rugby power in the Pacific. And in fact, if it weren't for its international reputation in this sport, the archipelago would be completely forgotten. Frank has been living in the Fijis for 17 years. But this is the first time he's come to train the players of Bukama. Still, everyone knows him because he worked with the National Rugby Sevens team here. Mm. 
Fiji is uh, the furthest island uh, here. It's a Sawa, and that's the furthest village there, Sawirara. It's a new adventure each time, but more important, there's the notion of sharing. They really like to share their experience, their history. That's part of how they teach the sport here, because the rugby in Fiji really meshes quite well with their culture and traditions, and also with their history of warring between villages. Now they don't make war anymore, but the village over there comes every Saturday to play that village down there. So in a way, they're carrying on their warrior rituals of the past. Fijian rugby, the clan spirit is an essential element. Each match begins with the thimbi, a warrior dance designed to provoke and intimidate the adversary. Rugby is a combat sport, and in the Fijis, the warrior enjoys a privileged social status even more so than a school teacher or a doctor. If God invented rugby, he surely invented it for the Fijians, and in particular, Sevens rugby, no doubt about it. And I think that's just what God did. He invented rugby for the Fijians, the Tongans, and the Samoans. Seriously, it's a blessing for these countries because it can channel all the energy of the youth and the warrior spirit that goes with it to defend their village to defend their island. It's essential, so we have to use that. The coach is sitting in the village. Something we don't know, we learn from him. And the first time, too, we see Frank. We just hear his name on the radio, see on the TV. First time to see him. Organic goalposts, respect for the environment. We use what we have at hand to construct the goalposts. This is genuine rugby, like we used to play as kids in the villages of southern France, in Catalonia and in Occitania. We used to do things like this, so for me, this is like going back to my roots. There are some 200 Fijians playing in different French rugby clubs, and the demand keeps rising for these rugby artists with their singular style, a mixture of power and improvisation. I've had the good fortune to discover players in their unpolished state. I often cite the example of two players I recruited right from their village. They were practically barefoot, with just a T-shirt, and they were fish farmers to help their parents support the family. And six to nine months later, there I am at the National Stadium in France, watching them play in the finals of the top 14 in front of 80,000 people. A thrilling moment. Just fantastic. 
Being a rugby trainer in the Fijis means dealing with the oppressive heat and the slow rhythm that goes along with it. For the moment, there are only children in Bukama. No sign of any players yet. I think we're going to be running on Fiji time, meaning practice will begin around 3.30, 4 o'clock. Maybe. Time is a vague notion on the island, because no one has a watch. There is no time. So we'll just wait and see. A good coach should always arrive before his players. That's not very hard here. Hello, Charlie. Hello, hello. How are you? How was work? Good, good. Yeah, yeah. The teammates, they're gonna come soon? Ah, uh, yeah, soon. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Take the coconuts and we're gonna go in that part of the field, eh? For now? All right. It's, uh, this part of the field is better. Okay, let's go. <laughs> oh, yeah. When you do the group game, then I blow whistle. Oh, then you go long passes. Ready, go! Get out of the way, guys. A time in such shoulder, good. Well done. Ready, go! They're not used to training. They're not used to having strict practice sessions, not used to organized drills. So you have to break them into the routine. But once you do, they take the ball and run with it. Straighten up! Good! Very good! All right! You just have to give them a few pointers, put a little order into their game. And once that's done, they know how to do the rest. Good! All right, pass, 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 put it down, put it down, run away. Rewind, rewind, rewind. Yeah. All right, go. On joue pour rigoler, pour they play for fun, to relax, which is a strong point because I think you need a playful dynamic to do well in sports. You really have to have fun enjoy it, and all the rest will flow naturally. The really nice thing about these islanders is that their basic motivation is the joy of playing. Good! Place the ball! Go! Thanks to his reputation, Frank is respected by everyone here. Today, he's training future players, but Fijian trainers as well. He has also set up a prisoner rehabilitation program Frank is teaching them the profession of referee. I think rugby is a social regulator. You'll notice that in countries where there's not as much rugby, the crime rate's extremely high, but not here in the Fijis. And I noticed the same thing in Tonga and Samoa. All the young people play rugby. At 4 o'clock in the afternoon, they get out of school, they get off work, they come in from the fields and they play rugby. And when the match is finished and they've gotten rid of all their aggressive hormones, they're worn out, with no energy left to go out and get themselves into trouble. All right. Crouch. Bind. Set. All right. Look at that. Beautiful. There. Yes. All right. right.
There are no roads to speak of here, so people get around with the village's one motorized pirogue. In the Yasawa Islands, they even bus the children to school by boat. In Bukama's village school, there are three levels in each class, and the children learn English right from the first grade. English and rugby, both legacies of the British colonization. At recess, Frank organizes a rugby match. It's France versus Fiji. All right. Hey, you, so you score a try over there? Got it? And you guys score a try over there? Right? Yes. So you must pass a good ball to one girl? Yes. All right, and we must have three passes. The women of Fiji are struggling to free themselves from the weight of tradition, and Frank is convinced that sports are one of the best ways they have to achieve that goal. Love Love Promoting women's rugby has been a personal crusade of Frank for 30 years. He's convinced that playing rugby in school will bring about a change in people's attitudes. Come on, guys! Naka, eh? Naka. That was fun, eh? Yeah. All right. You like rugby, eh? Yeah. That's very good, and you're going to be a very good player. <laughs> yeah, you're going to be a very good player. All of you. Thank you. Okay. Women's rugby is really taking off now. And here in Fiji, we have the Fijianas. You're going to, maybe you can play for Fijiana, eh? Yeah. Huh? national. The national team who beat New Zealand back in October and were world champions in sevens rugby. So they have enormous potential which we'll have to nurture in order to take on the really big teams. Okay, let's do a cheer. Let's go. Frank continues his voyage on to the next island, on to the next rugby pitch. As a trainer, Frank has always sought to transmit his passion and love for this sport. It's very important to me that the Fijian trainers and coaches be competent so that they can carry on the work themselves and not depend on the know-how of us Westerners. As the saying goes, it's more important to teach a person to fish rather than fish for them. That has been the guiding philosophy in my work here. I always try to stand back a bit and help them to grow and develop. For Frank, rugby in the Fijis is a lovely romance between a game imported from the other side of the planet and a people born to play it. Somewhere on Earth is heading to Asia to discover Laos, the land of a million elephants, a realm of mountains, water, and forest. The Mekong, the world's 10th longest river, crosses the country from north to south and sets the rhythm of life for the six million Laotians. Bordered by China, Burma, Vietnam, Cambodia, and Thailand, Laos has no direct access to the sea. Half the country's territory is covered by forest. It's an island of greenery, populated by more than 60 ethnic groups and a vast store of cultural wealth. Leua, an itinerant vendor, spends most of his time traveling with his family on the upper Mekong near the borders of China, Burma, and Thailand. He knows this mythic river inside out. 
Peng is also an inveterate traveler, but he sets out for the most remote corners of the country at the wheel of his old army truck. Peng, who practices meditation, is progressing on the path of wisdom that all Buddhists dream of traveling. A thousand kilometers to the south, near the Cambodian border, are the Khon Pa Peng Falls, the largest in Southeast Asia. Soan is a fisherman, a very dangerous profession. Every day, these men working above these turbulent waters place their life in the hands of the spirits of the Mekong. I don't cast my net just anywhere. I cast it only in the spots I know well. This is how I feed my family, according to what nature is willing to let me have. After its involvement in a global conflict, Laos, one of the most heavily bombarded countries on Earth, was long isolated from the rest of the world. Now, Laos is a haven of nature and tranquility. All its rivers flow into the Mekong. Asia's legendary river, called the Mother of All Waters, is a vital artery for the country's inhabitants. Lewa is a sailor of the Mekong. There are many dangers on the river. At each tricky passage, he has to check out the pitfalls. I've come down to check the water level this morning. I'm wondering if my boat can make it through here. There are rocks, a lot of rocks and there's not much water depth for the boat. So no, I won't come through here. It's impossible. Lewa has been navigating on the Mekong for more than 20 years, but he's been captain of his own boat for less than six months. All year round, he travels the river with his wife and two daughters selling his goods. I've had some very scary moments. I always have to be really on the alert. If I don't pay attention at all times, I could have an accident. With the rocks, the slightest error and the boat sinks. If I'm not sure, I prefer not trying to go through. First, I have to check that the rudder is working well. If I'm not in control of everything, I'm taking a risk. It's dangerous here, and I'm putting my family in danger. The Mekong Valley, usually so quiet and sleepy, seems to be waking up. Leoa at the wheel knows that the slightest error in piloting means a shipwreck. The rapids are like a step, an obstacle they have to get across. He's pitted against the river in a dogged struggle. The boat is practically at a standstill. <laughs> e 
Each millimeter gained against the current is a victory. The boatmen or the river? Impossible to tell who will win out in the end. The adventurers of the Mekong all know that the river has the right of life and death over its travelers. It's like a mountain torrent. There's a lot of current. Right here, the water accelerates. The current is very, very strong, and it's hard to make any headway. The river is powerful. Yes, I was really afraid. Water is the source of life. We drink it, but it can also kill us. Leua crossed four sets of rapids that day, each one a moment of anxiety. The motor is on its last legs from the struggle up the river. Leua has to get his family to the shelter of the next village before nightfall. We should all respect the Mekong. People shouldn't be dumping everything into the river. We drink the water of the Mekong. If no one protects the river, it will stay dirty. We should all respect it. It's a nurturing mother for us. The river was here before us. It gives us a living. Everybody here should take care of it. Our couple is quite a lovely story. We're husband and wife, and we always travel together. We trust each other, and we love each other, and we love our children. There's no problem in our couple, and there's a lot of affection in our family. I love this life we lead. Leewa recently bought a 20-meter longboat. It's an old craft, but it has a smart line. In any case, it carries the dreams of Leewa and his whole family. Together, they go up the wild valleys of Laos to sell their pottery and transport anything the villagers living on the rivers may need. Leewa knows all the secrets of the Mekong. There are no markers on the river. There are no charts. Navigating this river means knowing it by heart. Every bend, every hill, every tree, every landmark that could help sailors get their bearings. I am a man of the Mekong. I've lived on the river ever since my early childhood. My whole life revolves around the Mekong, and that's how it will be as long as I live and as long as I can keep going. The machinery tires quickly in this sweltering heat. Leo has to take care of the motor, for the trips last several days. Maneuvering through the Mekong's rocks and treacherous currents, Leewa has to know that he can always count on his motor. In the rainy season when it's high water, the rocks are really submerged. 
so it's easier to navigate. But right now it's the dry season. The water is low and it can be dangerous. My main worry right now is the motor. If it breaks down, that means big problems. It should be okay. It'll hold up, at least I hope so. I'm not really afraid. The boat continues its ascent of the dusky waters of the Mekong towards the north of Laos. There are no roads or trails in these remote regions, so the only way to reach the isolated villages is by boat. I'm really glad to arrive. I've been on the river since 8 this morning. I can finally get some rest. In any case, we can't go any further. Night's coming on. It's too risky. It's always an event when the floating vendors arrive in a village. This evening, Lewa is stopping in a small Kamu village, an ethnic group that lives along the upper Mekong, one of Laos's 60-odd ethnic communities. We'll spend the night here in Benwain. It's a Camu village. I'm going to see if I can make a few sales at the same time. I really know this place well, and there haven't been any vendors here for quite a while. This is one of my regular stops. There are so many villages along the Mekong. The villagers buy my jars and use them to make their beer and rice wine. The villagers may not always have money, but they do always have something to barter. It'll take just a few minutes for Leua to unpack and sell his wares. I really like traveling. I enjoy the scenery. It's lovely. I like visiting villages like this one. I feel at home all along the Mekong. I really feel at home. Navigating is our way of life and our livelihood. The villagers here welcome Lewa like a member of the family. Hospitality is one of the cornerstones of Laotian society. The slightest occasion becomes a good reason to break out a jar of the traditional beer, a Camus specialty. I sold almost everything. Soon I won't have anything to sell. I'll have to go stock up again. The lights of the Mekong exercise an irresistible attraction on voyagers. The ancient land of a million elephants was for a long time unexplored territory. In the late 19th century, a French adventurer from Brittany traveled the length and breadth of Laos. His name was Auguste Pavi. For years, Pavi traveled the peninsula of Indochina on foot. The Laotians who traveled with him during those long years of walking called him the Barefoot Explorer. 
At that time, the maps of Southeast Asia were still riddled with blank patches. In 1895, August Pavi drew up the first map of Indochina. He had a particularly tender eye when photographing Laotians. At the end of his life, Auguste Pavi, forgotten by history, wrote in his memoirs, I knew the joy of being liked by the people with whom I stayed. The Mekong is the soul of Laos and the lifeblood of the peoples along it. Everyone tries to live off the river. Adventurers, peddlers, traffickers, and gold prospectors. In their village near Luang Prabang, the former royal capital, Leoa and Boivan turn out hundreds of pieces of pottery. When they're not plying their wares on the river, they spend their time making jars and pots. I dug out this kiln with a shovel in my own hands. It's five meters long, and the hearth is three meters down. We can fire 700 pots or 300 jars at one time. I have to keep a close watch over the firing for 24 hours, a whole day and night. So, we're off again. We're going up the Mekong to the north to sell my wares. This is my profession. It's how I make my living. This is the life that Leoa has chosen. He and his family live a free, nomadic existence on the Mekong. Peng and his uncle Pao are partners from way back. Together they've covered all the trails and tracks of Laos. <laughs> Their work tool is an old Russian truck. It's robust and just never gives up. Today, they're taking on a load of banana tree trunks. This is where we come to load up. We'll take these trunks to the elephants. I have an elephant too. Mine's made of iron and has wheels instead of feet. And my elephant can do 120 kilometers per hour. You know, nature is generous here. You can just plant anything. Everything grows naturally. This is really a land of abundance. The elephant is the symbol of Laos. The country's elephant population numbers just over 800. 
half of which are still wild. The Asian elephant was domesticated by man over 4,000 years ago. The Mauts are the elephant's masters, the only ones capable of controlling the instinctive power of these impressive animals. Even today in Laos, these giants of nature are still used for work in the forests. Each elephant has its own personality. It's a sensitive animal and can understand more than 50 commands. Peng and Pao arrive in Sayaburi. They've come to deliver their banana tree trunks to the Laotian Elephant Conservation Center, the only place of its kind in Southeast Asia. Here at the conservation center, a team of veterinarians takes care of the animals. They free the females from their work in the forest so that they can raise their young for the first years of their life. The domesticated Asian elephant is a fragile animal. Its low rate of reproduction makes it an endangered species. In Laos, the elephant is called the cousin of the clouds, maybe on account of its color, but surely because it loves water so much. This morning, Peng and Pao are eagerly awaited visitors, for they're bringing the elephants their favorite snack. According to the popular beliefs in the eternal cycle of reincarnation, the elephant is the final stage before becoming man. It's a very important animal for we Buddhists. It's a sacred animal. They say that Laos is the land of a million elephants. They are beautiful, so majestic. Peng is back on the road. For a long time, his truck was used by the Laotian army for troop transport. Seeing it eat up the trail like this, one could say that this truck is a sort of resume of the recent history of the country, a collateral victim of the Vietnam War. This truck is a akak. We can go anywhere with it. Up mountains, across rivers. It never gets bogged down. On tough trails, it can take up to two tons. But it's hot inside the cab, especially in this season. It's an oven. There's no air conditioning. It's a Soviet truck. It's all pretty complicated. An old truck, but it's unstoppable. The seat in the cab 
is directly above the front wheels. So I'm getting bounced all around all the time. It's not easy to handle. The road is a family heritage. For Peng, it's even a vocation, almost a spiritual quest. It's a free life. No constraints, no pressure. I can stay on here with the monks if I want. There's no one telling me what I have to do. When I have a load, well, I earn my living. If I don't, it's no problem. I'm not bothering anybody, just the opposite. That's what my trucker's life is like. I live from day to day, and mostly I try to live according to the rhythms of nature and the passing seasons. I try not to bother others, and I don't want others bothering me either. I am striving to make my heart pure. He who is at peace with himself eventually manages to be at peace with others. He purifies himself, he develops and evolves. Peng often makes stops to meditate. He has always been attracted by the monk's life, its serenity, its sharing. Sometimes behind the wheel of his truck, he dreams of withdrawing from the world to follow another path. In Laos, a man can choose to devote several years to a spiritual retreat and to live the life of a monk before coming back to society. Peng's life is a long road, a path that allows him to live as part of nature, to follow his destiny, and to reach out to others. Now we can get across. I'm an old hawk hawk driver and I'm good. I learned from very skilled drivers. When you're going uphill, you have to know how to help the motor, go easy, work the brakes, know how to use the four wheel drive. Mm. 
eating up these dusty trails for more than 30 years. Its cruising speed hardly ever tops 30 kilometers an hour, but no obstacle seems to stop it. In the mountains of Laos, time seems to stretch out indefinitely. Peng and his uncle have been on the road for more than three days, and the morale is still as solid as a rock. We've got a little problem with the truck, but it's nothing serious. We'll take a look at it. A few minutes with a screwdriver and a hammer are all it takes to get the old truck rolling again. Bopenyang means no problem in Lao. This could be the motto of the whole country. Bopenyang. Bopenyang. Everything is possible in Laos. We can repair anything. With a good dose of determination, we can do anything. And with a bit of patience, we get what we want. Here in Laos, we try to keep life simple. But you can't just say, Bopenyang. If you don't take action, nothing will happen. As the Buddha taught us, there's nothing certain in this world. It's up to us to find peace in the depth of our heart and to find serenity. Only then can one achieve happiness. Peng is fully aware of the risks of the road, but he has faith in his karma, this principle of Buddhism that says people's lives depend on their acts and their past lives. Driving the trails of Laos, Peng is living the spirit of Buddhism. If he ever gives up this roving life, it will be because he has embarked on the path of awakening a different voyage that's like a return to the essential. We're in Kunpapeng. This is a fishing region. Everybody here makes their livelihood from fish whatever the season or time of year. There are some very dangerous spots here where I don't dare go, where nobody goes. I don't cast my net just anywhere. I cast it only in the spots I know well. This is how I feed my family, according to what nature is willing to let me have.
For more than 30 years, Soen has been casting his net into the turbulent waters of the Mekong. Khon Papeng in the extreme south of Laos are the largest waterfalls of Southeast Asia. Here, fishermen brave their fear to cast their nets in the eternal combat between man and river. The Eternal Cloud. This is where Soan comes to earn his livelihood. In the rainy season, the water level of the Mekong can rise two to three meters, so Soan always has to adapt. He still has a few weeks left before the sky becomes overcast with clouds full of the monsoon rains. The the high water occurs in the ninth and 10th month of the year. It gets very high here. Then no one wants to come here. It's all flooded. During the dry season, the water is very low. So I use different fishing techniques, like fish traps. In any case, I catch only the minimum, just enough to meet my needs. Soan heads back to his village through the treacherous currents. Every time he goes fishing, Soan has to cross the Mekong. He doesn't have his own boat, so he counts on other fishermen and has to pay for each crossing. Upriver from the falls, the Mekong gives an impressive display of its full might. Here, near the border with Cambodia, the Mekong widens into an enormous inland delta. The 4,000 islands form an incredible labyrinth of land and water. We're very close to the waterfalls. We're OK right here. There's no danger, but we have to be prepared for anything especially if the motor breaks down. You always have to have an oar in the pirogue. Right now, the current's not very strong here. It's all right. But if we break down, we'll have to row. It took Soan 20 days of hard work to build this boat. It's his first boat, and he's very proud of it. This little craft will change his life. Soon, he'll no longer have to count on others to cross the Mekong. But before he launches his boat, Soan has to keep an important rendezvous with the river spirits. I'm bringing offerings to the shaman, the great protector of the river, so that the spirits will protect my boat. In Laos, the Basi is a ceremony that seals the destiny of people. The shaman recalls the 32 souls that each human being possesses. The Basi is a way of drawing to oneself the positive influences of the spirits. This is an auspicious day for me. I'm going to launch my pirogue. This means a new life for me and my family. It is really beautiful. I love this boat. It's very well built. I really like it. This is going to make my life so much easier. I'll be able to go where I want, when I want, and I won't have to depend on others to go fishing anymore. I'll soon be independent.
When he has enough money to buy a motor, Soan will be able to navigate on the Mekong with his own boat. It's good to live on the Mekong. It's a nice life. It's like traveling on a clear and easy road. I could not live without the Mekong. This river is in my blood. It is part of me. The Mekong is a legendary river. It runs more than 4,500 kilometers from the Tibetan plateau down to its vast delta. It crosses all of Laos, Cambodia, and the south of Vietnam. The Mekong also borders Burma and Thailand. The lives of 70 million people depend directly on this river, the 10th largest in the world. When I come to fish here in the waterfalls, I have to cross with this cable. There always has to be two or three other fishermen nearby to ensure my safety and to help me if I have a problem. And likewise, I am here to keep an eye on other fishermen. This spot is dangerous. Here on the Mekong, we all help each other out. We catch carp, catfish, all kinds of fish. When I have a small catch, I keep some fish to feed my family. When I get a big catch, I go sell them so I can buy gas. But even more important, I can pay the fare to cross the river on the boat. To make a livelihood from the river's resources, the fishermen have to adapt and be resourceful. The Khon Papeng Falls form a natural, insurmountable barrier. In the tightly knit community of fishermen here, the most daring are also the most respected. These are the tightrope walkers of Khon Papeng. the Mekong dominates this wild, untamed landscape. Under the admiring eye of Soan, Sam Nien juggles with the laws of equilibrium. The cable was strong when I was 12. I'm 50 now, and I'm still crossing it every day. It's part of my family's patrimony. No one else can use it. These are my cables, and I discourage anyone else from using them. If an accident were to happen, I'd be held responsible. The cables and I are one. The danger is that the cable gives or that my hands slip. If I fall, my life is over. It's very dangerous.
The environment is hostile, and the climatic conditions are extreme in this part of the world. Today, the sky is shedding its excess energy. It's 40 degrees Celsius, and the first monsoon rains are pouring down. Soen has come to see the village healer. This man is a storehouse of knowledge about plants and natural remedies. Soen has been getting dizzy spells lately. He also comes regularly to consult about his malaria. Depending on the diseases, I'll do incantations. I'll prepare concoctions. I'm an accomplished healer. I'm going to give Suan the medication to treat the malaria. That's what's been causing his anemia and dizziness. I've been a healer for about 30 years. I treat many of the villagers here. There are also people from the whole region who come to see me. I treat everyone who comes to consult me. Even though the fishermen of Kon Pa Peng may be protected by the river spirits, they're still constantly risking their lives. It takes nerves of steel to brave the dangers. The slightest error can be fatal for these balancing artists of the Mekong. They need to maintain perfect control of their balance, their movements, and their own fear. Here at Kon Papeng, there are in fact very few accidents. In the spots with a strong current, where there's lots of water, we cannot cross. It's impossible. We know that. That's just how it's always been. Despite all that, if someone decides to cross anyway and they slip, they are done for. How can one appreciate the multiple facets of this unpredictable, mysterious river? At Kon Papeng, locked away in the memory of the fishermen, are all the secrets of the Mekong, the mother of all Asian waters. I just marvel at the nature here. I want to stay close to it. It is in my blood. My fondest wish is to be able to keep on enjoying this harmony. In 
the heart of Southeast Asia lies the kingdom of Cambodia with its fascinating, elusive charm. After years of turmoil and conflict, Cambodia is now well on the way to reconstruction. There's a yearning for peace, evident in the revival of the ancestral arts, but also in the rediscovery of Cambodia's natural treasures. Here, there are people committed to a better life and to a new battle, saving the environment. Tonle Sap, a miracle of nature, is the lifeblood of Cambodia. More than just a lake, it is the elusive domain of water. With its floods and droughts, it sets the rhythm of life for three million Cambodians. Orn Sao is a child of the lake. Water has always been part and parcel of his life. I have, in fact, always lived on the lake. I wouldn't know what to do on dry land. What's more, I know how to handle boats and skiffs. On land, they use bikes, scooters, and cars. And I don't know anything about all that. I don't know how to do the things they do on dry land. Orn lives on the western part of the lake, in the village of Prektoal, which literally means end of the shores. Six months a year, the river overflows its banks and floods the forest. A village like any other, or almost, for here nothing is fixed, everything floats. Life is suspended, gliding along the surface of the water. Camera, rabbit, that's enough. Get out of the water. I don't want to. We teach them how to swim so they won't be afraid of the water later on. We worry they might drown. They start learning when they're three or four years old. It's so when we go off somewhere, we don't have to worry about an accident happening back home. Like children all over the world, they love swimming, but not bath time. It stings. Life on a lake means adapting. To go anywhere, you have to take a boat, even if it's just to drop in on the neighbors. From a very young age, the lake dwellers have to know how to handle a wide variety of craft, even more so since there are no traffic regulations on Tonle Sap. The village school is a very popular spot because it's the only place where the children can run. Orn is getting ready to leave for 10 days. He's a ranger in the Prectoal Bird Sanctuary. My big worry is if my family gets sick during the night, there's no one to take them to the hospital. On dry land, you can always walk, but here, you have to know how to handle a boat. You wearing daddy's hat? Come on, a little kiss? Today, daddy's going away to work in the forest. I'm off. Don't worry. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> 
Bye bye. There are 42 rangers to keep watch over the sanctuary. The patrols always take place in tandem. For Orn, the profession of forest ranger runs in the family. He's teamed up with his brother, Rota, for their patrols into the flooded forest of Prectoal. In 1997, the UNESCO declared Tunle Sap a World Biosphere Reserve. Good morning, sir. Ah, it's almost finished. I'm coming up now to give you a hand and to see that fantastic view from up there. The rangers have constructed a dozen such platforms. They're used to survey the zone, to count the animals. They also serve as base camps. Oh, cool. Building a platform like this takes two days with five or six people. But if there are only two or three of us, you have to figure six, seven days. First, we have to study the type of tree. Then, we have to figure out the best angle for the platform so we have an unobstructed view. That makes it easier to count the animals. Now there has to be a clear view, and the tree has to be the tallest one around. The two brothers cut the motor and row into the heart of the reserve to avoid spooking the animals and to spot eventual poachers. Thanks to our efforts, poaching has been reduced about 90%. We make our rounds. We're stricter. We take shifts to keep watch over this place night and day. Hi, guys. How's it going? Great. So, what's the report today? Have you seen anybody bothering our animals? No, nobody. Just some local fishermen. We gave them a friendly talking to. It's time for the new crew to take over until the next change in shifts. It's so hot. You take notes and I'll observe. Move forward. Check the feron yellow first. Wait, I'm focusing. There are loads of birds. I see white all over. 23, 24, 25 females. 11, 12, 13, 13 nests. The fish-filled waters of Tunle Sap make it a paradise for migrating birds that flock here in the mating season. But the excessive poaching of nestlings and eggs has disrupted the ecosystem. Out of 100 species listed, 11 are in danger of extinction. Before, my father and I used to poach animals for a change of diet because we ate nothing but fish and to bring in a little money. 
When we were poaching, we'd take everything. We would empty all the trees. There'd be nothing left, not a single species of bird. Then later, there were groups from the Ministry of the Environment and NGOs that came to inform people about endangered animals, to explain and educate us about the reproduction of species, because there were some birds on the brink of extinction. So my father and I thought it over, and we decided to get involved and to work for the protection of nature and birds to preserve them for future generations. The lake is a source of life for the birds, but for the people as well. The water hyacinth, an invasive plant harmful to the environment, is an abundant source of raw material for the village women. They've formed a cooperative and export their craft work all over the world. Fishing is still the main activity on the lake. It has allowed the lake dwellers to meet their needs since the dawn of time. Ten days later, Orn has finished his shift and is now back in the village. Hello, my friend. Hi, Orn. You haul up your nets? Yes. Can you sell me 20 or 30 kilos? I don't have that much. I'll take whatever you have. I have 12 and a half kilos. Okay, go ahead. Orn needs a lot of fish. He has many mouths to feed. This fellow here is in fine shape. We have about 60 crocodiles in all here. And there are four categories. The one-year-olds, two-year-olds, three-year-olds, and the over tens. These crocodiles help round out Orn's meager ranger's salary. They're sold for their meat and for their skin as well. Orn started his crocodile farm about 10 years ago. Back then, I captured some in the wild. I can say that now because these laying females here, they're at least 10 years old. And these are the crocodiles I captured with my father for breeding. Now, I didn't take many. We captured two or three, okay, well, four or five, and we keep them for breeding. Go on. Pull the rope that way. Pull, pull. Hey, camera. Hey, camera. Come here. We're leaving. It's time to go. Twice a year, they make the big move. They 
They don't bother with trucks and packing boxes here. They simply move the house with the whole family inside. There's the high water season and the low water season. Now when the water level rises, we move back towards the forest. When the water recedes, the level is low, and that can destabilize the house, make it rock on the bottom, you see? So we head for deeper water so the house doesn't get grounded. As the Khmer saying goes, you have to follow the channels to enter the estuary, which means we have to adapt to all sorts of situations. The birds do the same thing. In the high water season, they leave the lake. Then, when the water level drops, they come back to the same spot. This former poacher has radically changed the direction of his life. Protecting nature is his way of refusing to yield to fate. About a hundred kilometers away, young Amon Nem also decided to challenge destiny. Three hundred and fifty-two steps and a seventy-six meter climb separate the gods of the Vat Banon temple from mere mortals. Usually, I train from 8 to 11 a.m. and from 2 to 5 in the afternoon, Monday through Friday. I've been doing circus for 10 years. At first, your muscles get really sore. Sometimes, your joints hurt. The training is hard, and it takes up a lot of time. You really have to persevere. The main thing is to stick with it for your own future. Aman is 19. He was born in Batambang province in the west of Cambodia and is now a student in the town's circus school. First off, I do circus because the far circus school is right near my house. Before, my family was in a bad way. We were poor. My brother was training then, so I would go watch him, and I saw that the school would give out cookies. So whenever cookie day came around, I would go train too. Amon goes home after each training session. His brother, Sopa, is also a circus performer. While attending the far school, he was spotted by the National Circus School in Quebec. I'm beat. I've been at it all day. 
Sopa now works with the world famous Cirque du Soleil. Between tours, he shares his experience with his younger brother. Here's the family photo. My parents have 12 children, and seven of them are in the circus. There's my brother Brandy, Sotia, Aman, Contia, Tira, Pello, and me. I saw that my brother traveled to France, so one day I asked him how come he got to go to France. And he said, if you want to go to France, you have to be in the circus. I tried it, and I liked it, and, and yeah. I feel like I have a lot of support, because I have a brother in Canada, another who is a professional in the Siam Reap Circus, and my big brother who is a good circus teacher. So I'm surrounded by family who can guide me in my choices. I would be very proud to be as good as them. Thanks to the success of his children, the situation of Aman's father has improved, and now he has a tuk-tuk. Today, he's taking Aman to see his brother perform at Siem Reap, 170 kilometers from Batambang. When my children started going to the far school, I thought they were just going to learn how to read and write, that they would be doing a normal program. I didn't know they'd be doing circus arts. And afterwards, I watched their training every day because I was afraid they'd get hurt. I'm very happy to see my children doing so well. My dream is to become a performer who plays all over the country, all over the world, and all the countries that I've never been to. That's my dream. I want to see, to hear, to experience how beautiful it is and how difficult it can be. Where my limits are. That's it. I want to experience everything. Every day of the year in the Siem Reap Big Top, the acrobats warm up before the show. Det Kwon is one of the nine founders of the school that trained all these performers. At the beginning, we only taught drawing at the school. Then, in 1996, we started a music department. And then, in 1998, we started the circus school. The idea was to help the street kids, the vagabonds, the poor children, and give them the chance to learn an artistic profession. <laughs> Aman has gone backstage to see his brother. You need help? No, 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 you'll mess me up. <laughs> when I see how talented my big brother is, I'm not jealous of him. On the other hand, when I see the others, I want to do better than them. But when it's my brother trying out something new, I want to do just as well. But it's not in a spirit of competition. This entire adventure sprang from a place free and open to all, a unique school, Far Pon Le Selpak, which literally means light of the arts. It's open to underprivileged children and goes from kindergarten through high school. An education in the arts here puts the smile back on the children's faces. Keep your hands up, straight. 
Straighten up. Okay, go down to the end, come back, and turn here. Brandy is Aman's eldest brother. The career of an acrobat is short. He retired from performing at 33 and became a teacher and choreographer. Keep your balance? Yeah, just like that. When I was a child, I was in the street selling cakes. It was what you could call the life of poor people. As soon as I started studying here, it made me very happy. It changed my life and that of all the members of my family, my brothers, my sisters. It's all thanks to the generosity of the far school that encouraged us to go on stage and sent us to study abroad. These kids are like me. There's no need to force them. They came of their own free will. They saw something amazing, they liked it, so they come to train like me before. Learning the profession means sweat, sacrifice, and injuries. On stage, there's no harness, no nets. These athletes are entering a high-risk profession. I'm Venezuelan. I think that it's the same where I'm from. Both are countries that are not rich, so I can really understand. You always have to have the dream, the motivation to go far. Circus in Cambodia dates back to the 6th century AD. It was not merely an affair of street performers. It was ranked among the noble arts and entered into the spiritual world of pagodas and temples. The totalitarian Khmer Rouge regime tried to put an end to everything that recalled the divine and the kingdom. Very few dancers capable of teaching the age-old gestures of the Apsaras survived. Here, at the Far School, they are reviving these arts that nearly disappeared. The memory of the circus is also engraved in the Holy of Holies, in the temples of the ancient kingdom of Angkor. Det spent his childhood in refugee camps. The arts have allowed him to heal the wounds of war. For 23 years now, he has devoted himself to the revival of his country's ancestral arts. This section here illustrates the circus in pre-Anchor times. Was the circus the same back then as it is now? Uh, I think that back then, they didn't have as many techniques as now. Look, on this bas-relief, you can see a man. He's on his back juggling a wheel. And here is a man lifting three others. They were strong to be able to carry three men. As far as overall technique goes, that's international. It's universal. But what marks us off from the others is that here, it's inscribed in this wall, which proves that it goes back at least to that time. Look, it's carved into the stone, indelible. You 
This bar relief is kind of damaged, but even so, you can see the detail of the sword swallow. It's going down his throat. His throat has to be perfectly straight for it to pass, otherwise, there's an accident. My specialty is the fire staff. I didn't know the first thing about it. I saw the other kids spinning fire staffs, and I wondered how they managed to make the flame flare up. Shonda is in the same class as Aman. To become a circus performer, one has to strive for perfection, to surpass oneself, and then to surpass the others. I'd practice all the time, even at home. I'd take a normal stick with no flame, and little by little, I got to be comfortable with that. Eventually, the teacher noticed me and let me practice with fire. I think it was because he saw I was making good progress. The circus is an art that dates back to ancient times. And I'm happy and proud to be carrying on this art today. We work to improve so that it continues to evolve so that people here and abroad realize that it is a beautiful art form. Becoming a circus artist means rehearsing tirelessly to make the public believe, at least while the show lasts, that magic is possible. With their bodies as their only instrument, they prove to us that dreams can become reality. Aman's story is also the story of many other children like him, the story of poor but determined kids who give their all for their dreams and eventually work their way into the spotlight. Present-day Cambodia is resolutely turned towards hope and the future. To travel to the ends of the earth, to pursue one's dreams wherever they may lead. The idyllic shores of Cambodia are the unexpected scene of an extraordinary adventure. Thirteen kilometers off the southern coast of Cambodia lies a string of islands as beautiful as they are fragile. Beneath the surface of the water, marine life is suffering in silence from the damage of illegal fishing, which is rampant here. Twelve years ago, Paul Ferber began a new life. He left England and landed on these tropical islands in the Gulf of Thailand. He has never gone back. He decided to devote himself to this sea that gave him a new lease on life. I'd like to think I'm an advocate of the sea. Um, when you see something that's, that's wrong, you have to try and do something. You have to try and do something to make it right. So the, the aim being here is to protect all of the ocean, to bring it back, to, to make it what it once was. Which you're probably looking at a couple of hundred years before that happens. It'll never happen in my lifetime, but if I can actually just bring it back to a point where it's a healthy, functioning ecosystem and it will, it will do the rest itself. 
With the help of the government, Paul settled on this previously uninhabited island, Koatse. He's the founder of MCC, Marine Conservation Cambodia. His NGO regularly receives a dozen or so Khmer and international volunteers and scientists. In order to protect the marine life, they designed a system of reinforced concrete towers. Everyone lends a hand for the work, even Paul's son, B. B, you know why we do this? Yeah? To make the house for the fish to live in. Maybe if we're really lucky, we can grow some oysters on them too. Huh? The oysters will clean the water. Yeah? We uh, put some seagrass, the seagrass is very good. Yeah, the seagrass around them, yeah? Okay. Pretty good, huh? Four, four, four years old, and the first thing he says is, can we have seagrass too, because it cleans the water? <laughs> One, two, three. The very, very first initial idea was anti-trawling. Trawling is such a horrific and destructive way of fishing. It's like cutting down all of your fruit trees, you know, just to get one harvest. So the idea was to create something big enough, heavy enough and stable enough to stop trawling boats. They can almost be like little miniature natural aquaculture units. Um, after two years, there would be able to be a sustainable harvest. So at least one block would sustain one family with, with collecting oysters. Um, mussels, we can grow them in there. You know, it's not just about making the ocean beautiful again. It's about making sure that all of the people out there have something again. We see the life coming back all the time. The first changes were very slow. You know, six months, seven months, and we've seen maybe three or four more fish, and the water's still pretty dirty. But now, after three years, it, it, it's starting to explode. It's amazing. You go in, and, and every, every other day, you're seeing a species that you haven't seen here before. It, it's really hopeful. I mean, it's still only our tiny little area, but with, with the government agreeing to expand the conservation areas over the next year, we can, we can expand. We can, we can take that and start to just build more and more. Life on the island unfolds to the rhythm of nature and the activities of the community. Paul now lives permanently on the island along with his wife and five children. Ka, ka, ka. The scientists that pass through take turns in homeschooling the children. Delphine Duplain came here from Quebec two years ago. She's in charge of mapping the project. Here is the island of Kosei. Here is the dock and the reef and the protected area where we'll place the blocks, a zone 500 meters by 150 meters. There'll be a block placed every 50 meters. These underwater towers will be like sentinels all around the island. You can't see them as you would see them on the land, but the fishing boats will realize right away if they try to sail in here. It's like an invisible shield. The island has an interesting past. Now it's in the front line fighting for the environment but it also bears the scars of yesterday's wars. For the island is situated in a strategically important spot near the Vietnamese border. They began to build bunkers here during the Second World War. This continued under the Khmer Rouge, who were at war with their neighbors.
I come to the pier often at night. Uh, from here, I can tell exactly where the boats are from the noise of the engine. I can tell what type of boats they are because we're attempting to stop the illegal boats that are destroying the area. When we first started here, you, you could literally feel the noise on the island. You'd feel it through your feet. The, the island would be shaking with the noise of the boats. They were so close, it was big, and it was every night. Uh, now, it's decreased a lot. If we were to hear an illegal boat now, the first thing I'd do is inform to the fishery administration. Uh, then we would inform to the police. And depending on their answers or whether they can do anything was, depends on whether we would then go out to tackle that boat. Paul watches over a zone of about 80 square kilometers. He records each one of his interceptions. And sometimes they have to get tough. Okay, two sets of pair trawlers straight through the middle of Cambodia. Two he is here, one over here, two more over there. Cambodia's territorial waters have been ravaged by illegal and destructive fishing methods like trawl nets, dynamite, and electricity. That night, there were so many illegal boats that Paul and his crew received armed assistance from the authorities. It's one way to keep the outlaws at bay. At dawn, the horizon is once again calm. It's time for the local crab fishermen to haul in their traps. Paul keeps himself informed through regular contact with all the local fishermen. They're doing pretty good. All the crab in here. We're on a long tail, um, small scale fishing uh, using uh, what they call Lop Kadam. Lop Kadam is basically a, a, a collapsible crab trap. They've got 2,000 of them that they laid out last night and they're pulling up now. Something cut the line. There's a one or two damaged traps. But every time they lay their traps, they, they don't know whether when they come back to pick them up, those traps will still be there. When the trawling boat comes through, most of the time they just don't care about the small-scale fishermen. So there'll also be a line of traps underwater. As their net comes through, it catches those traps. When they pull up their net, they could be three or four kilometers away and they've dragged all of that fishing gear to there. It's got damaged along the way. And then once they do pull it up, they'll just have some ropes and some traps and they'll just cut that. They don't want it. They don't care about it. They cut it and throw it back in. Uh, we really, really, really want to support these guys because this, this type of fishing gear is, is very, very sustainable. <laughs> It's true. I myself have lost thousands of traps, especially over there. There are little fish and crabs, but when the trawlers come through, they just rip up everything, even the coral. Paul himself refuses to fish, so when he gets the chance, he buys seafood from the locals to support the type of fishing he believes in. Paul has had a thousand and one lives. He attended police school. He has worked as a mason. He was a stone cutter, florist, tree doctor, first aid worker. 
When he became a diving instructor, he saw how urgent it was to save the sea. He was a trailblazer in creating Cambodia's first marine sanctuary. small stuff. When I went diving, it wasn't about all the big things you could see or the clear water. It was about finding all of the really bizarre and strange camouflage creatures. Um, ghost pipefish, the nudie branches, all of the, all of the small marine life. A creature right out of a page of mythology has riveted Paul's attention. I came to Cambodia, I did a dive in Sam Lom where I saw 56 seahorses in one hour. Four different species and, and from juveniles to big, beautiful, colorful adults, it, 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 it blew my mind. Uh, I had never seen anything like it. And I started to video them, photograph them. I used to go out every day, just spent, that was all I did. I just take, every time I went out, just go to see the seahorses. Paul is one of the rare specialists in seahorses, this unique species where the male bear the young. Some of them have been marked so a cleaning is in order to identify them. Even though it has survived for over 40 million years, the seahorse is now besieged by many dangers. It is a much sought after remedy in traditional medicine. People attribute all sorts of powers to it on account of its strange looks. And then, for whatever reasons, the, the, the trawling fleets from Sinukville, um, and including a few Vietnamese boats which came specifically for the seahorses, just started to trawl all of those areas. So I would go down to see a seahorse I'd been filming for a month or two months, and there was nothing, there was no home, there was nothing, the, the, the sand was bare. Um, the, uh, I remember seeing a little purple one on, all crushed, it had just been crushed. And, uh, yeah, they destroyed everything that I loved. So that's pretty much how MCC started. They, they destroyed the areas. Paul is a model of courage and determination. Okay. He has made radical life choices straight from his heart and mind. How many you got, babe? You got enough? Jasmine! He's 40 years old. He's not rich, but he is free. <laughs> most important, he's protecting what he holds most dear, his family and the nature that surrounds him. Let's go see you, Mama. Not already yet, see? Two or three days and can eat, okay? My feeling for, for my children, I, I see that there's so many things that are wrong with the world. And the biggest one is that we destroy it. We destroy it every day. And kids are taught in schools and, and, and in just, just through the TV and magazines to aspire to so many things that really are just not that important. The latest fashions and who's got the best trainers and, you know, it's fantasy stories about things that just are completely unreal. It's... it's I, I want them to grow up with, with an appreciation of the earth and a connection to it, and a, a connection to nature that, that allows them to be change makers, you know. I hope that I instill in them enough of the importance that 
unless some people stand up and start to do something to change, then nothing will change. The, the world will become darker in their lifetime than it ever has in mine. Situated in the Indian part of the vast Himalayas, Ladakh is a land of lofty arid mountains, furrowed with deep valleys. It is also known as Little Tibet and the land of high passes. The men and women living in these high isolated villages and along the rivers dotted with glaciers emanate deep sincerity. Buddhism and its traditions are at the heart of Ladakhi culture. Still, the population is managing to adapt to the profound changes brought about by the region's recent boom. The inhabitants of Ladakh know that faced with nature, they have no choice but to remain humble and to make do with what she can offer them. A vast crowd of believers from the four corners of the Himalayas has gathered here at the Hemis Monastery for the Naropa Festival. They are all followers of Drukpa, one of the major schools of Tibetan Buddhism. This huge festival takes place only once every 12 years. This branch of Buddhism is based on the teachings of Naropa, a holy man who lived in India in the 11th century. The festival is particularly lavish this year because it is also the 1,000th birth anniversary of Naropa. For this special occasion, the monks unveil a huge embroidered silk tapestry of the Buddha. It is the largest such tapestry in the world. His Holiness Gyalwang Drukpa, the 12th reincarnation of Naropa, leads the festivities surrounded by the dignitaries of the monastery. Through his progressive teachings, this spiritual guide encourages the monks and nuns to become shining examples and symbols of modernism. <laughs> Does it hurt when you cough? Yes, it, it hurts a bit in my chest. And do you sleep well? Not as well as I used to. In a tent on the fringe of the gathering, Dorje is giving free consultations. She is a Buddhist nun studying medicine. Since early morning, she's been treating a constant stream of people. What's your name? Sondoma. How old are you? 66. 66? 66. 66 years old. Four years ago, Dorji left her quiet monastery in Ladakh to study traditional medicine at a school in Delhi. 
I'm simply overjoyed. I'm so lucky to be able to learn this profession. It was my dream to become a doctor. Now I can make a difference. I can help people. Here, a prescription for your bronchitis. It's true I haven't finished my studies yet, but these consultations allow me to practice and treat patients. It's a wonderful experience. The pills and powders that Dorji prescribes are all made from plants found in Ladakh. The daytime is devoted to religious instruction, but at night the colorful festivities take over. The Naropa festival is a mix of traditional folklore, popular culture, and Bollywood-style dance numbers. The lights of the festival have gone dark, and silence has reclaimed the mountains. Dorji has arrived back at her monastery, lost among the peaks of Ladakh. When she was 17, she decided to leave school to become a Buddhist nun, a profound and personal vocation. It was the choice of an altruistic life. <laughs> Every morning, she goes off by herself to meditate for a few hours. Practicing meditation is very beneficial. Seen from the outside, it looks simple, but it is in fact quite difficult. If you don't meditate regularly, you don't make any progress. It's important to do it with sincerity. The path to elimination is long. You have to meditate for months and even years. It's like milk. First you have to milk the cow, then you transform the milk to finally obtain the butter. The basis of meditation is looking at yourself and controlling your own mind. Me, I'm still just a beginner. One, two, three, four, one. The nuns in Dorji's monastery practice Kung Fu, to be strong mentally and physically, but also to break down the outdated barriers between men and women. Traditionally, only men teach and practice this martial art. I stopped doing Kung Fu for four years because I went to Delhi for my medical studies. So I forgot a lot and it's hard for me to keep up with the others. But I like it a lot and I'm glad to get back to it. I really have to start again from scratch. It. One. Oh. Two, three, four. We just want to change one thing, you know, one thinking of the world that, you know, girls are not less than boys. We just want to go ahead than them. And we just, you know, want to, you know, I just want to say that uh, every girl, they have a power inside them. We just have to take it out with ourselves and go ahead. It doesn't mean that, you know, a woman has to always stay in the kitchen and cook something for their husband and everything or something, blah, blah, blah. We can do everything. Just the problem is we're not, you know, the, all the girls in the world are not getting a chance to do something, to show something, to tell something. So we're just, you know, like uh, giving a message to all over the world that give chance to girls, see what they can do. Better than boys. I can just say, Shimbi. Yum. Ciao.
In a few days, Dorji will go back to Delhi to continue her studies. But first, she's going to visit her childhood village to gather medicinal plants along with three of her friends. I usually go back to my village once a year in the summer. It's the best season for picking medicinal plants. Otherwise it's not possible on account of my studies. It'll be great fun collecting plants with my friends and seeing my family. Mom, how are you? Hi, come on in. Come. Hi, Grandpa. How are you? I'm fine. Please sit down. Grandpa, would you like some tea? It's with salty butter. Where will we go for the plants? We'll see tomorrow. We'll get up around 3, 3.30, and you'll leave around 5. I'm tired. My neck hurts. Dorji's village is perched up above 4,000 meters, the ideal altitude for what she's after. Medicinal plants are everywhere if one knows how to spot them. Hey, look! I think I found something. Oh, you know, yeah. You see, that's it. This is Tsava. Look, every part is useful. The flowers, the stem, the roots, each is used to treat a particular ailment. And we can mix it with other plants with different properties to make pills. Now, the younger generation puts its trust more in modern medicine. But by sharing this traditional plant lore, Dorji is keeping this body of knowledge from dying out. This one is Kemse. Show me. This is also a medicinal plant. It's good for treating back pains. So, in a nutshell, the five main plants are Kemba, Umbu, Palu, Shusuke, and Sepet. With these plants, we can treat wounds and minor pains. Medicinal plants are our country's precious stones. They grow where the air, water and soil are not polluted. All the plants we pick are natural and pure, so they've kept all their curative properties. If you grow them with chemical fertilizers, they won't be as effective. By studying medicine, Dorji is fulfilling herself as a woman and at the same time helping others. It was her dream when she decided to become a nun and it makes her mother very proud of her. I'm very happy that Dorji is studying to become a traditional doctor. It's a good choice because it's a noble calling. The only thing I want is for her to do well in this vocation, and I pray for that. It's time to say goodbye and get moving. Dorje is leaving Ladakh with this summer's harvest and heading back to her school in Delhi.
See you next year. Goodbye. She still has three more years of studies before becoming a traditional doctor. My truck is like a little apartment. I cook and sleep in it. I even spend more time here than at home. Sure, I'm glad to get home and see my family, but I'm also happy in my truck because I get to see new places and travel. With his indomitable truck, Namgyal brings supplies to Ladakh's most isolated valleys all year round. Now, after a week on dizzying roads, he's heading home to Leh, the region's capital. This city owes its prosperity to its strategic location between China and India. Back in the time of the Silk Road, Leh was a key stopover for the camel caravans. Now, with a population approaching 40,000, this noisy, dusty city continues to grow and attract villagers from the isolated communities higher up. Namgyal, like many Ladakhis, came to Leh looking for work when the state began to build roads to connect the valleys. At the time, they were recruiting drivers brave enough to handle construction trucks and tackle Ladakh's high mountain passes. Before he takes to the road, Namgyal buys the supplies he'll need for his trip. And now he'll pick up some really important items. Truckers in Ladakh have a very keen sense of style. Hey, my friend. Here, I'd like to buy one of these. Take your pick. How much? 100 rupees a pair. Do you have any in black? Let's go see inside. Okay, how much? 200 rupees. And I have a lot of nice stickers for you, too. Nah, I don't want any stickers. Come on. They're perfect for a truck. Look, a rose, really nice. And we have hearts. And this one, the Indian flag. It's great. What else do you have? Here, this, to clean your truck. Plus, you can use it as a clothes brush. Oh, come on, it's already broken, look. I have other stuff, look. A solar lotus. How much for the prayer wheel? 400 rupees. So, what's the total? 1,500 rupees. Okay, I'll give you 1,000. Deal. Seeing as you're my first customer of the day. So long. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. How about this? Or maybe this? My truck is my work tool. And thanks to it, I can bring home the bacon. It feeds my family and puts my children through school. My truck is a Tata. I went to Jammu to get it in 2014, and then I drove it to Punjab to get it painted and decorated. Here in Ladakh, we like beautiful things. Hey, where are you off to? To the Nubra. See ya. Okay. From Leh to the Nubra Valley is only 120 kilometers as the crow flies. But the road trip is no walk in the park. There's a major hurdle, the Kardong La a pass perched up at 5,360 meters. 
This road is known throughout India and the rest of the world because for a long time it was the world's highest motorable road. It lost its title recently to the new roads that the Chinese built in Tibet. I like this road, and I know it like the back of my hand. As soon as the truck is loaded up, you have to get moving. And even if I'm afraid sometimes, I have no choice. The trucks are high and wide, but even worse, most of the road is very narrow. In good weather like this, it's okay. But it is dangerous when there's snow. Namgyal has been running the Kardong La Pass for 15 years. Now he's one of the veterans, one of the few truckers who'll tackle this road as soon as the weather permits. Their courage and experience has earned them the respect of the other drivers. Personally, I'd rather drive at night. There's less traffic and you can see the oncoming headlights. In daytime, you never know when a car is going to come barreling around a corner. Driving at such high altitudes is a real challenge. Above 5,000 meters, the lack of oxygen prevents the motors from running smoothly. The Kardong La Pass has its price. The trucks are dragging and wheezing when they make it to the summit. When I take the mountain roads, I pass by holy places, and I always string up prayer flags. Other people come here just for that, whereas I'm lucky enough to pass by these spots. They're on my way. According to the Buddhist religion, the wind caresses the holy prayers and scatters them to the four winds, transmitting their messages to humanity and the gods. A few kilometers beyond the pass, Namgyal makes a stop at his mother's village. How far are you going today? Down to the end of the Nubra Valley, Mom. Be careful. Drive slowly, my son. How's the family? Oh, just fine. My son has had all sorts of jobs. He worked as a messenger boy on construction sites. He was also in the army. He's always been the one to put food on the table. I can't remember if he got his elementary school certificate. He left school when his father died because we didn't have any money. Sometimes I'll bring my mother some flour and fruit. There are no orchards here. We're too high up. Otherwise, I'll send someone to bring her some apples and apricots. I don't come through here very often, because right now, the shipments are going to Changtang and India. When I make a long-haul trip, it lasts at least 20 days. Oh. Oh. 
lakas. These high mountain villages seem frozen in time. Cut off from the rest of the world for a good part of the winter, these small communities of robust men and women come back to life in the springtime when the roads reopen. When he can, Namgyal acts as a messenger, bringing the latest news from the neighboring villages and from the capital. The Nubra River Valley, situated close to the Pakistani border, is one of the most well-preserved regions of Ladakh. With its lower altitude and milder climate, it is the orchard of Ladakh. Namgyal is coming into the final twists and bends. His trip is ending. He'll be able to deliver his shipment. Hey, Stanzen, how's business? All right, thanks. Here, that does it. What's new in Lay? Oh, everything's fine. No problems with the past? Piece of cake. Great. Thanks a lot. Call me for the next order. At the end of each day, I try to find a nice place to pass the night. Here today, somewhere else tomorrow. Hotels and restaurants, they're not for me. Before leaving the Nubra Valley, Namgyal stops at Diskit, a 14th century monastery clinging to the mountainside like an eagle's nest. Soon, Namgyal will have to tackle the Kardong La Pass again on his way back to Leh. He's praying and making offerings to the monastery to obtain the protection of the gods. He'll even have his truck blessed. The DAC is developed very quickly, but at the same time, we're losing our traditions and our culture. Personally, I think that such rapid change isn't a good thing. Too much progress kills our traditional values. I think it would be better if Ladakh remained Ladakh. Traveling at the wheel of his truck, Namgyal has witnessed firsthand the radical changes his country has been going through. A native of the mountains, he travels the length and breadth of Ladakh to earn a living for his family.
Others have taken their destiny in hand and are striving to reconcile traditional society and development in this remote province of India. My name is Stanzin Dorje, but everybody calls me Stanzin Gia, because Gia is the village where I was born and raised. Having my village's name added to mine means a lot to me, because I'll never forget my roots. Life unfolds at a leisurely pace in Gia. This village is off the beaten path and has managed to preserve a certain harmony between the villagers, their animals, and the surrounding mountains. Gia is one of Ladakh's oldest villages. They've found traces of human activity here dating back to the second century BC. It's harvest time, and all through the village they're grilling the freshly picked barley. Then they'll grind it up to make a flour called sampa. There's a lot to do at this time of year, so Stanzen has come back to his village to lend a hand to his brother and sister-in-law. Nowadays, people are eating less and less sampa. They'd rather eat rice and wheat, which are subsidized by the government. However, there are a few villages, like Gia here, where the farmers understand that it's important to consume local produce. So they've gone back to growing and eating sampa, and it's gradually becoming the staple food. Until the age of 15, Stanzen was a shepherd along with his sister. Then, when he still could hardly read or write, he left his village to pursue his education. Since then, he has traveled widely in India and abroad, and he would like the whole community to benefit from his experience. We've recently started growing sweet peas here. The problem is that the seeds are expensive because they come from Kashmir and Delhi. So, to be self-sufficient, the farmers keep seeds from the harvest to sow the following year. They don't have to buy them anymore. And peas grow really well here. <laughs> Stanzin is fighting to improve the everyday life of these villagers. He has an ally in this undertaking, his friend Christiane Mordelet, a French woman with a passion for Ladakh. Their goal is to reorganize the community based on sound, sustainable farming methods. Together, they founded an association of the region's shepherds and a cooperative run by the women of the valley's four villages. The farmers and the shepherds are in fact completely interdependent. And if the shepherds disappear, so will the farmers. And then the village will disappear. So they need a little bit of help from all sides to try to re-establish a new constructive connection and mutual respect among all the concerned parties. The women are certainly proud of what they're doing. And so are we. 
Et puis nous aussi. Stanzin is now 39, and he has become Ladakh's first documentary filmmaker. Whenever I come here, whether in summer or in winter, it immediately reminds me of a story. Before my father died, a lot of nomads would come to sell salt in Gia, my village. I asked my father, where does that salt come from? He told me that there was a lake high up, Lake Sokar, and the salt came from there. I was 13 or 14. Thank God, I've been lucky enough to travel, but every time I come back here, it makes me cry for joy. It's just so beautiful. No writer, no composer could ever express all the beauty of this place. This lake is not only a delight for the eyes. You can feel in your heart that this is like a resting place for the gods and goddesses. The effects of climate change are even more visible in the Himalayas than elsewhere. In 2014, Gia was hit hard by a sudden flood. The glacier upstream from the village is receding, and a pocket of meltwater formed. When it gave way, the torrent destroyed everything in its path and swept away the village's only bridge. Urgan, Stanzin's brother, was there. He was the one who gave the alert. It was around 11 o'clock at night. The water hadn't risen yet, but I noticed a strange smell. Then later, around midnight, I heard an enormous noise. The water started rising, and it kept rising. Around four in the morning, the water had risen above the bridge, and it was cascading over it. After a while, half the bridge was torn away, and the force of the water ripped away the banks. Stanzin was alerted by his brother during the night and arrived at the village early in the morning. Helpless before the raging elements, he took out his camera to have a record of the disaster. Before, our village of Gia, and even the entire region of the Himalayas, was a real paradise. There were no problems. The people had a good life. They lived in harmony with their land, so they weren't afraid of the climate. Now, every year, in 2002, 2003, 2004, and especially in 2010, there were natural disasters, and it's getting worse. 
It's becoming dangerous here. People are worried about floods every summer. When will my house be wrecked? When will my cattle die? I'm afraid too, like all the Ladakhis. It's really starting to prey on our minds. How can we come up with a solution to the climate problem? The family house was spared by the flood of 2014. Stanzen comes home to his village, far from the bustling capital where he lives half the time, to enjoy the peace and quiet. Here, in the cocoon of his childhood, he finds the inspiration for his film projects. It's not easy living everyday life with one foot in the modern world and one foot in tradition. I'm not the only one who feels torn like this. A lot of Ladakhis feel somewhat lost. If you live your life respecting the traditions, you miss out on the modern world. And if you live in the modern world, you lose the traditions. There's a huge question mark between these two worlds. Making documentaries is Stanzen's way of finding a balance between present day and traditional Ladakh. His extraordinary destiny has taken him traveling, in his childhood when he was a shepherd with his sister, then later abroad to international film festivals. But Stanzen has never forgotten where he comes from. His sister is still a shepherdess. As a tribute to her, he made her the subject of one of his documentaries, The Shepherdess of the Glaciers. Today, Stanzen is going to give his sister a surprise. He's going to show her the film for the first time. Thanks to my camera, I can transmit the beauty of Ladakh and the Himalayan mountains, the beauty of its people. I've been very lucky in becoming the first Ladakhi to make documentary films. Many films have already been shot here, but since I grew up here, I can do an even better job of capturing the traditional ways of life, the culture, and art of my region. I'm proud to be Ladakhi. His sister, Tsering, is still living with her flock a half-day's hike from the village. The only human being in these rugged mountains 4,500 meters up, she is one of the village's last shepherds. I'm so glad to see you. How are you, my sister? Great. What about you? Good, yeah. Not too tired? No, I'm, I'm fine. You don't get bored all alone? No. Yeah. Let's go have some tea. You have a good trip? I surprised you, didn't I? I was wondering who it was in the distance. I didn't recognize you. Tsering lives in her tent year-round. In winter, the temperature can drop to minus 40 degrees Celsius. This wild region is home to wolves and snow leopards. It takes an enormous strength of character to live in such a rugged, isolated spot. Hey, 
Lennon. You want to see it? Yes. How did it turn out? You'll see. It's the film I did about you, remember? Yes, I remember. I'll show it to you on my computer. Come on, watch the film. <laughs> Look, it's your film. <laughs> it's embarrassing. I'm shy. Don't be embarrassed. Look, it's beautiful. <laughs> Ah, oh, come on. Don't cry. Oh, my little baby goats. They're like your little children, huh? Yes, they're so cute. I love them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I can't believe that's me. Hi. It's as if it was some other woman. Why? Shepherding is a very hard job, it's true. But even if the younger generation goes to school now, we'll always need shepherds. People say, I have a degree, I don't want to be a shepherd because the working conditions are too harsh. But it's not good for anyone if there are no more shepherds. I don't know what others think about me, but deep down, I think that even after you get a good education, you can still choose to exercise this profession because it's so rich and it's indispensable for everyone. <laughs> As he accompanies his sister with her flock, Stanzin is taken back to his childhood. He remembers all the special moments he shared with Zering. From his vantage point up in these mountains, Stanzin can measure just how far he has come in life. Yeah. 
There's one very important thing. We are made of flesh and blood. It's like a house. Over time it ages and falls into ruins. Eventually, we all pass away. Everything I filmed with my camera will remain, and they'll be able to show it to future generations. It's a testimony. That is why I'm a filmmaker. Just go.